Welcome back, everyone. I'm Shilpa S., Associate of Academy at CPPR, and your host for this first technical session on synergies between IPOAI, FOIP, and AOIP. So we are now entering into the exciting part of the conference. We are delighted to have among us eminent personalities who have vast academic expertise and could shed more light into this discourse. Our eminent panelists in the first session will discuss and deliberate on the convergence between the Vision Outlook Initiative of India, Japan, and the ASEAN. India's Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative is built around seven pillars that focus on practical cooperation spanning the security development capacity building continuum. Similarly, Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific, FOIP, seeks a free and open maritime order in the Indo-Pacific region. Likewise, the ASEAN aims to develop cooperation with other regional and sub-regional mechanisms in the Asia-Pacific and Indian Ocean region through the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, or the AOIP. A convergence of these vision outlooks can create fruitful partnerships. The session includes a question and answer round towards this end. I request your participation and undivided attention in order to enrich these discussions on this theme and to bring out effective policy recommendations. The chair for the first technical session is Professor W. Lawrence S. Prabhagar, advisor to CPPR. He is also an author, researcher, and professor, international relations and strategic studies, and formerly with the Department of Political Science at Madras Christian College. So I invite Professor W. Lawrence S. Prabhagar to this session. Welcome, sir. Now, I would like to invite the panelists for this session. Dr. Kasudoshi Tamari, sir, Associate Professor, School of Policy Studies and Graduate School of Economic, uh, Economics, Chukyo University, Nagoya, Japan. I welcome you, sir, to the session. Secondly, I would like to welcome Ms. Sanjana Joshi, Senior Consultant, Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relation, ICRIER, New Delhi, India. I welcome you, ma'am, to the session. Thirdly, I would like to welcome Professor Geetanjali Sinha Roy, Assistant Professor, Jindal Global University, Sonipat, India. I would like to welcome you, ma'am, to this session. So I now hand over the proceedings to the chair, Professor Lawrence. Kindly take over, sir. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Lord God for this opportunity to come to this conference uh, on the Indo-Pacific Vistas for India-Japan relations and uh, relationship and cooperation. I thank uh, Dr. Dhanuraj and Team CPPR for the meticulous, excellent arrangements that have been made here. Now, being the first technical session of this particular conference, let me set the uh, main discussing points and our speakers would follow in terms of that. Now, what do we find in terms of synergies between the Indo-Pacific outlooks? Now, the first thing that has happened in, in the whole region is this that in the light of what we would call the rising China, which has been abrasive, which has been aggressive, and the host of conflictual situations that has been around the Indo-Pacific, we find that the Indo-Pacific seems to be a, a region of paradoxical choices. The Indo-Pacific has been a region of commensurate economic growth, and at the same time, we find that the Indo-Pacific has also been a region of what we could call arms races. And there has been a, a spree of strategic and military modernization that has gone throughout the region there. So what we find in the Indo-Pacific essentially is a stability-instability paradox. That stability-instability paradox needs to have certain amounts of undergirding stability in which we will find that member states of the region would like to basically come with a kind of a consensus. The result of the deliberation of, of these consensus has come in result of what we could call the various visions of the Indo-Pacific. India has been one of the first countries to come with the IPOI, the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative, followed by Japan, which is the uh, free open Indo-Pacific, 
and the ASEAN Open Indo-Pacific and the Australia Indo-Pacific, Indo Open Indo-Pacific has also been coming to it. So these vision statements, in, in reality, they provide what we could call multimodal sectoral cooperation in various non-military sectors, aiming, from, uh, from a aiming to achieve what we could call considerable stability in the rise of an aggressive threat actually there. While not mentioning China very clearly in all these Indo-Pacific initiatives, we find the nations do have convergences or what I call functionalist approaches towards better cooperation that has fostered good relations among these states there. That has been the fundamental purpose of the Indo-Pacific outlooks there. The second, outlook, the second purpose of the Indo-Pacific outlooks is to create a common vision of all these countries in the region to come on a single page into what we could call as what Professor Nalapath today mentioned in terms of a possible Indo-Pacific Charter, like the Atlantic Charter of 1941, this, there could come at a later stage a possible Indo-Pacific Charter that will be based upon the following aspects there. One, it will be based upon democratic ideals, because democratic ideals are the key basis by which these states have come into cooperation there. Whether it is India or Japan or the ASEAN or Australia, we find all these countries do believe in liberal democracy and therefore that liberal democracy seems to be the cornerstone of widespread cooperation in the region there. Thirdly, I think sequel to this democratic consensus, we find that the Indo-Pacific is going to be a region of economic frameworks. I think already there are enough economic frameworks in the region and uh, some have been in experimental. I think the latest being the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which has, been, which has been discussed, touted for a long period of time. But of course, there have been some kind of differences between countries with regard to the technicalities there. So economic frameworks of cooperation will lay the fundamental basis of cooperation between countries, boosting interdependence, because interdependence is a key factor upon which we will find that countries in the region will be able to foster economic growth there. And as long as countries are going to spend more time in terms of free trade areas, in terms of economic frameworks of cooperation, in terms of commercial trade opportunities, in terms of technology transfer, we will find the region expanding into a period of stability actually there. Amidst of the Cold War, in Cold War 1.0, we find that the United States led an economic revival throughout Europe so therefore, there needs to be a sequel of an economic revival that has to come with regard to the Indo-Pacific. And that economic revival will be the basis upon which we will find countries will come into greater economic convergence and cooperation then. Thirdly, we find security convergence coming in the region because security convergence is a vital factor which cannot be ruled out. Because even as we face instabilities across what we could call the South China Sea, East China Sea, and we know very, very clearly as to how these instabilities have spiraled out into conflicts and disputes. There needs to be a security convergence that comes through active defense diplomacy. And that active defense diplomacy can be the basis by which we will find countries in the region doing common exercises, looking into technology transfers, and possibly at a later stage can also go in for interoperability there. The enduring alliance is the, Indo <coughs> the US hub and spokes alliance, which is the mainstay of the region's stability. But we find that other you know, agencies or institutions like Quad is coming to play a vital role, and Japan uh, plays a vital role in terms of the Quad, not only the Quad membership, but also in its operations there. So security convergence is, is an area that has to be debated in extensive uh, measure and to see how it can range from maritime security to conventional security and also to look into possible contingencies of a possible China invasion of a Taiwan and what kind of responses could come into it. This is coming into loud play because uh, as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war, the China-Taiwan con uh, China -Taiwan contingency has also been thought aloud actually there. So security convergence plays a vital role in terms of it there. And fourthly, uh, the Indo-Pacific is going to be an expanding area of digital connectivity there. I think these technologies are transforming the Indo-Pacific in terms of fintech, in terms of 3D printing, in terms of artificial intelligence, because each of these are going to be catalysts as to how they transform the region actually there. 
And that is going to be the mainstay of what we could call the digital economy that will come into the region there. And that digital economy is something that is going to transform the region in the coming years to come. And finally, the objective of the Indo-Pacific Charter could be a rules-based order. And that has been the desire of all democracies. Because democracies do believe in what is called as a rules-based order. And the respect of international law, particularly in maritime zones, where conflicts could easily spiral out, out of control there. These five principles, I view, will be the mainstay of the synergies that could come in terms of the Indo-Pacific outlooks that can come in the region there. So let me conclude at this point of time, and I'd like to have our honorable speakers, Dr. Tanari, to come first and speak about the Japanese perspective, uh, Dr. Roy, who will talk about the Indian perspective, and Dr. Sanjana Joshi will give an economics perspective. Over to you, speakers. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Kazuto Shitamari from Japan Chuchu University uh, in Nagoya. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, let me thank uh, CBPR and uh, Council General of Japan in Chennai for giving me, giving me this opportunity to come to this beautiful city, Kochi, Kerala. Uh, this is not uh, my, my first time to come to Ko Kochi, Kerala. Uh, it was 14 years ago. In 2009, uh, I came here for the first time. When I was a uh, MPhil scholar, in JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Okay. Jawaharlal Nehru University. So uh, at that time, in 2009, we were not using the term in the Pacific. Of course, that world itself in the Pacific were there in the other field, but we scholars in international relations security studies in the diplomacy, we didn't use the term in the Pacific. So in short, this is being new. It's a new concept, new world. And also, it, it is not mature. So there are diverse conception, a lot of version of the concept itself, and also policy. Now, Japan, India, United States, and European countries, recently South Korea have it, their own strategy or policy, in the Pacific policy, strategy, vision, and so on. So uh, this is, uh, it is, will be my role uh, in this conference is to talk about Japanese perspective on not only FOIP, but also in the Pacific. So I, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, development of the concept and policy of in the Pacific in Japan. And also a little, a little bit about synergy with uh, India's EPOI and ASEAN's AOIP. So this is the uh, chronology of the in the Pacific. POIP, free, open, free and open in the Pacific, uh, started in 2000. 16. This is very famous, so you know. So I, it, uh, I, I will not elaborate itself here. But before that, before that, we, Japan and India, were using the term in the Pacific officially. When? It was in 2014. Prime Minister Abe proposed to use the new concept in the Pacific to Prime Minister Modi, and they agreed. But also, this, is, this was not the first appearance in the, our area. It was by Hillary Clinton, Secretary of the uh, United States at that time. And some people say, the Prime Minister Abe's conference of two series speech in 2007 was the starting point of the Indo-Pacific. But it's not true, unfortunately. Please check the script of the speech. The word itself, Indo-Pacific, did not 
appear in the speech. At that time, Prime Minister Abe proposed the broader, broader Asia, broader Asia as a new regional concept. But uh, actually, it failed. And of course, at that time, he talked about the connectivity, connection of the two seas, Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. But in the Pacific, it was not there. Then, who, re who put the importance of the, in the Pacific in our field? It was clearly by Hillary Clinton. She delivered one speech in 2010, and in the next year, 2011, she contributed one short paper to Foreign Policy Magazine. After that, we started discussing in the Pacific. And Japan, Japanese government started the term in 2014, almost exclusively with India at that time. So from two, uh, November 2014, 14, 15, and early half of uh, 2016, at that time, Indo-Pacific was almost exclu exclusively used in Indo-Pacific, yeah, sorry, India-Japan relations. Then, after that, I'll skip here, this. Well, let me touch a little about these slides. Uh, these are excerpts excerpt from the uh, Hillary's paper on the Indo-Pacific. So, I think there was a lot of discussion here in India. In India newspapers uh, paid so much attention to this paper. Then this is an article from website of Ministry of Foreign Affairs Japan, November uh, 14th, 2014. Prime Minister Abe uh, proposed to add to Japan relations a standpoint of contrib contributing to the stability and development of <coughs> Indo-Pacific. In my understanding, this is the first appearance in the diplomatic arena. And you know, uh, Prime Minister Abe announced uh, in the Pacific as uh, a grand strategy of Japan in Tikado meeting, Kenya, Nairobi, in 2016. And also after that, there has been some change of the Indo-Pacific concept in Tokyo side. And I want to focus on one policy change and also change of terminology on the Indo-Pacific in Tokyo. Uh, in November 2018, in one speech, Prime Minister Abe did not use strategy. Before that, Japanese government used the term free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Always, uh, this is a set uh, phrase. This is a set phrase, so free, open, and free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Always this phrase. But in the in a speech in November 2018, he said, the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Of course, it's a big change. It was a strategy. Now, this is not strategy. It's a vision. This is, this is before that, of course, there uh, there were some discussions in the government, and decision was made about this terminology. Then why? In my analysis, there were two major factors regarding the policy shift. One is the China factor. At that time, Japan-China relations were not so bad. 
or a relatively very good situation at that time. Imagine the situation after uh, situation at the very early stage of the COVID crisis. So much cooperation happened in Japan, China. Then, uh, one year before the policy change, Japanese government had expressed its support for BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. So Abe administration was trying to have good relation, try, trying to improve the relationship with China, simply. Put, simply. Therefore, uh, they separated the connectivity issues from security problems. Uh, Tokyo was also trying to have cooperation in the Indo-Pacific also, but of course this, uh, it didn't happen. This is one factor, the China factor. Another is India ASEAN factor. Some months before the policy change, Prime Minister Modi announced India's version of the Indo-Pacific policy, you know, uh, Shangri La speech. And at that time also, ASEAN countries were preparing their own Indo-Pacific policy. And next year, uh, 2019, it, will, it, it, it came out. It, it was uh, AOIP, ASEAN Outlook of Indo-Pacific. Then India and also ASEAN at that time had more modest view in their relationship with China. In other words, strategy was too strong. If we, Japan, use the term strategy for India and ASEAN, it, it was difficult to share the in the Pacific concept with Japan. Therefore, uh, based on these factors, this is my analysis. <laughs> According to my analysis, uh, Japanese government changed the Indo Pacific policy from strategy to vision. After that, uh, always uh, Japan uses a vision of the Indo-Pacific, uh, no, 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 sorry, uh, a vision of free and open Indo-Pacific. So you can see that uh, Japan came closer, closer to India ASEAN position in terms of the relationship with China, India's uh, inclusive approach. And lastly, so, uh, let me uh, tell you something about the synergy with AOIP and EPOI. But, so I want to say that we have basic commonalities in the Indo-Pacific. Now, it's not a strategy for us, it's a vision. So we have the common inclusive approach to our China. So we are not trying to make the framework as anti-China framework, but inclusive. It's a very important and common thing. But also there are some dif uh, differences. Japan looks West, put it simple. Uh, it, uh, the strategy to say was announced in Africa, Kenya. So we, Japan, has more focus on Africa. And on the other hand, India looks East. It's uh, a little bit different. So uh, India, ASEAN, 
Of course, Japan accepts the centrality of a, a, a ASEAN countries, but we have more Africa focus. It's a small different, difference. And second point is uh, about the definition of the Indo-Pacific. For India, Indo-Pacific is about ocean. It's an ocean. Indo uh, Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. But for Japan and also ASEAN, Indo-Pacific is entire region, not only ocean, but also land area. And now, it's a vision for, uh, for Japan. And IPOI is more project-oriented. It's a detailed project, so it's a difference. So that time is running out. So let me uh, repeat just three points. Why is that? Uh, in the Pacific, but uh, in the Pacific, uh, regarding in the Pacific, Japan, in, uh, India, uh, was almost almost exclusively using the term before for it, and Japan changed its position on the in the Pacific, and now we have common ground about the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tanani, for the uh, etymological presentation in which you outlined both the historical and the conceptual factors and the Japanese perspective of the free open Indo-Pacific. Uh, we'll have questions at the end of the session, so let me invite the next speaker to come and speak about the Indian perspective of the synergies between the three Outlooks, thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Center for Public Policy Research for inviting me to be a part of this August gathering. I would also like to thank our session chairperson, Professor Prabhakar, whose works I've been following in the domain of Indo-Pacific. Sir, it's an absolute honor to be in your panel. Uh, it also gives me great pleasure to be a part of this great panel where Sanjana Ma'am is there and also Professor Tamari is there. Uh, so today I, sorry for the mic adjustments. So today I would like to talk about the synergies between India, ASEAN, Japan in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we know that the region, basically the Indo-Pacific region, has increasingly become more and more important and specifically uh, with regard to global uh, economic and strategic interest. And thereby, it is crucial that we must work together in order to make sure we have a stable and prosperous future for all. Um, when I talk about the synergies between India, Japan, and ASEAN, I've been able to identify four uh, areas of cooperation which I talk about in my paper. While I identify the four uh, cooperation areas, I also give certain uh, policy formulations which uh, I still feel is in the working process, so if you have any comments, please let me know how I could improve my uh, formulations there. So the first thing that I uh, uh, found that one of the areas of key cooperation was maritime security. Basically, maritime security is very important not only for India, but Japan and ASEAN, because it makes sure that there is uh, the safety and security of sea lanes of communication for trade, commerce, and navigation. Also, with regard to India, ASEAN, and Japan, they all have expressed their commitment in making sure they uphold the rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. And they have also undertaken joint military exercises to enhance these capabilities. This is particularly important uh, given the increasing assertiveness of China in the uh, region. In fact, in the morning, there was a lot spoken about this, so I won't uh, go in there. Uh, also, India has been actively participating in regional and international efforts in order to combat piracy, uh, transnational crime, terrorism in the maritime domain, and these initiatives have uh, been fructified through the Indian Ocean Rim Association. ASEAN too has been actively participating in regional and international efforts to combat piracy, transnational crimes, and terrorism again in the maritime domain. Also, Japan has been actively participating in the regional and international efforts to combat pi piracy, transnational crime, terrorism in the maritime domain. And these initiatives have resulted through regional cooperation agreement on combating piracy and armed robbery against ships in Asia. 
Okay, so now that we've spoken about maritime, let me focus a little bit on a particular areas. For example, ASEAN has established a network of maritime uh, security-related institutions and agre uh, agreements, such as uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Maritime Forum, and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting. ASEAN has also been able to adopt certain, several protocols and agreements, such as the Code for Unplanned Encounters at Sea and the ASEAN Declaration on the Conduct of Power parties in the South China Sea, so as to promote peaceful and cooperative maritime activities in the region. Japan on the other hand, I repeat, sorry, Japan on the other hand has been able to establish a Japan uh, Coast Guard and the Maritime Self-Defense Force, which are extremely important because they're responsible for ensuring the safety and security of Japanese territorial waters. With regard to India, India has been able to make sure that the Indian uh, Navy has been responsible for safeguarding the Indian uh, maritime uh, interest and security and safety issues of India's territorial waters. So in my paper, that is one of the suggestions that I give is that if, uh, if we see, if we imagine the world map in front of our eyes, we see that all the three domains, which, is, uh, which we start from India, so India deals with issues in the Indian Ocean, ASEAN deals with issues in the South, South China Sea, Japan deals with issues in the East China Sea. So what I am trying to say, and I formulate my uh, suggestion in the paper, is that there is a need to have an interconnected grouping which makes sure that all the three uh, domains are interconnected. So basically there is a security connecting uh, line from Indian Ocean to the South China Sea and to the East China Sea, which if this group, if there is a group which is formed, then eventually the UN can also come in and other countries, for example, the other Indo-Pacific strategy countries can also become a part of this. This is just one of the policies that I suggest in my paper. Okay, uh, ASEAN has been actively involved in joint exercises, capacity building activities with uh, various dialogue partners, and they have also been working to enhance uh, uh, maritime security capabilities and cooperation in the region. India and Japan have also been doing the same. Specifically, they're working on maritime law enforcement uh, uh, search and rescue, and of course, disaster response. So in my paper, again, I suggest that if all the ASEAN countries agree, then India and Japan can lead uh, and initiate something called the India-Japan ASEAN grouping, where they can work towards capacity building exchanges with special focus on more uh, poor, uh, port calls, where India and Japan can equip ASEAN countries with more defense equipment, technology, and logistical support. Uh, of late, we are seeing that Japan has been helping Vietnam in a big way with regard to uh, defense equipment. So this is one of the examples. The other suggestion that I give in my paper is that India can help in a very big way with regard to personnel training to the ASEAN countries. Also, we saw during the pandemic how the, sorry, how the need for medicine had gone up, right? And I believe that there is a need to have medical shipping. For example, India can help ASEAN countries set up medical ships with uh, around about 800 beds, which would help not only the ASEAN countries, but also, uh, you know, portray India again in the domain of vaccine diplomacy, the respect that it got. Also, India, Japan can create and help ASEAN countries identify alternative ports, uh, which would help in making sure we have command and control systems. And also, um, we know that Japan has a lot of marine technology, which ASEAN countries could make the best use of. Again, India can help here by training the Coast Guard, uh, the Coast Guard groupings. Okay, another uh, suggestion that I give with regard to synergies between India, Japan, and ASEAN in the maritime uh, security domain is, we know that Quad is very much interested in maritime security. It is involved in joint naval exercises, information sharing, capacity building, and joint patrols. So thereby, there is a lot of effort this has been taking place in cooperation and coordination with all the member countries. In my paper, I suggest that if all the ASEAN countries agree, agree together, then an initiation or an initiative can take place between Quad and ASEAN countries, where they can work on the basis of the rule-based international order. They can also work on increasing the trade and commerce, and also increase more port calls, train ASEAN countries' services, and help them grow in the domain of the fourth industrial revolution, help them uh, digitalize in sectors of banking and finance, uh, also help them in agricultural training and development of countries, specifically for countries like Laos. When I spoke about digitalization, I'd like you to draw your attention to a couple of things. India's biggest example or success story is the UPI, right? Japan, sorry, Japan during Prime Minister Suga's administration came up with the concept of digitalization. 
That's the first time when they actually went really big about it. ASEAN is also working very hard on making sure they work more towards digitalization. If all the three, which is India, Japan, and ASEAN, work together in the domain of digitalization, it can really strengthen. And this is something we should really focus upon. Also, biotechnology is another domain where ASEAN countries could help one another. For example, there is a major need for highly nutritious food for countries like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar. And India and Japan can help them in that way. These are some of the suggestions that I've given in the paper. Please feel free to keep telling me if anything needs to be done. Also, another suggestion that I've given with regard to maritime security is, in order to deal with the Chinese aggression, there is a need to make sure we have alternative port sections. So I have suggested that we link or find a way to connect Guam, which is US, Okinawa, which is Japan, Kamranri, which is Vietnam, and Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which is India. This way, we're not only creating an alternative way of having more maritime routes, but also dealing with Chinese aggression. OK, so second, uh, the other point of cooperation that India, Japan, and ASEAN can work upon is blue economy. We know for a fact that India is very well known in its marine fisheries. India is one of the largest producers of seafood. And the fisheries sector is actually helping the Indian economy very well. Uh, also, we have to understand that India is also somewhere leading and helping out in seaweed. And we know that seaweed has numerous uses like food, pharmaceutical, and cosmetic industries. So basically, food, of course, Japan and ASEAN countries benefit from. Cosmetic industries, Japan and South Korea benefits from it in a big way. Also, we have to understand that the blue, blue economy, for example, um, India has been able to generate new jobs with regard to how coastal communities are using and making the best use of fisheries. They're also making sure how they are able to learn and harvest ocean energy. Uh, coastal tourism is taking a big way, and marine technology is exceptionally good. So India has been able to harness these. Coastal technology, I give you the example of Andaman Nicobar. Um, six months ago, I had visited Andaman Nicobar Islands, specifically the Andaman. And believe you me, they are doing exceptionally well with regard to coastal uh, tourism. Also, the Indian government has launched several initiatives like the Sagar Mala program, which basically deals with modernizing India's ports and improving coastal connectivity. And the National Maritime po uh, Fisheries Policy aims to promote sustainable fishing practices. These are certain developments that India has taken place in the domain of blue economy. Okay, so now let's talk about the developments that Japan has with regard to sustainable blue economy growth and advantages. Of course, Japan has advanced technology, expertise in maritime industries. The Japanese government and private sector have been able to collaborate and develop innovative technologies with regard to deep sea mineral exploration and underwater robotics. I'd like to draw your attention to one very simple thing. Deep sea mining ex mineral explora uh, exploration is very important for South China Sea, specifically ASEAN countries. If Japan can help out, which I'm sure it can, it will be a big help not only for South China Sea, but also in the Indian Ocean, if that's, that's an option which is uh, open. Also, Japan has been actively involved in international cooperations with regard to blue economy initiatives, such as the Indian Ocean Rim Association, where India is also a member, and Western Pacific Naval Symposium, where the ASEAN is a member. So indirectly, we actually have a kind of, uh, I would say, synergy happening here. Also, one more very important thing, Japan has made significant investments in renewable uh, uh, energy resources from the ocean, such as offshore wind power and wave, uh, wave energy. And this has been done to make sure the, 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 re the reliance on fossil fuels reduces in a big way and they pro promote economic development in a very sustainable manner. Finally, Japan is also working towards not only innovative technologies, but also making sure they're preserving and making sure that our, uh, the marine systems are very well taken care of. You have to understand Japan will be very much interested in blue economy because it's an island country, and it would like to have things for its future generation. And, and to be honest, um, having stayed in Japan, I realized the Japanese really know how to respect the smallest of things, and something uh, I think ASEAN and India should also learn that from them. OK, now let's talk about the efforts that ASEAN has made with regard to blue economy. Firstly, you have to see that they have developed a regional, plan of, uh, sorry, a regional plan of action for sustainable fisheries, which aims to not only have sustainable fishing practices, but responsible resource management. Uh, ASEAN has also been able to establish a regional center for ocean energy in Singapore, which is basically very, very important because it talks about the need for renewable energy sources from the ocean which is what Japan is also focused about in the previous slide when I spoke to you about that. 
ASEAN has also launched the Core Triangle Initiative, which basically talks about the collaborative efforts of six countries so as to protect and preserve the world's biodiversity and the ecosystem. ASEAN has also been able to establish a regional blue economy forum to promote dialogue and cooperation with regard to blue economy. Finally, of course, ASEAN too is working towards and maintaining the need that the, uh, there is a need to have good well-being of the ocean and the marine lifestyle. Okay, now that I have gone through India, Japan and ASEAN's efforts in the blue economy, we have to understand one thing that automatically blue economy is a very natural area of cooperation between all the three regions or like between all the three sectors or the places. But I'll, I'll like to quote a report. Uh, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development spoke about the potential economic benefits of blue economy to be enormous because it is estimated that uh, by 2030, three to six trillion dollars will be the amount they will make. Uh, in my paper, I suggest that India can help ASEAN countries modernize sports that India is doing with India's Sagarmala program. Also, ASEAN's Economic Community Blueprint 2025 highlights the need for sustainable marine tourism, aquaculture, renewable energy that can be provided and helped, uh, like ASEAN can get that help from, us, uh, from Japan because Japan is a global leader in uh, marine technology because we have country, uh, companies like Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, Kawasaki Heavy Industries who specialize in offshore wind energy and marine robotics. So this is where Japan can give back to not only ASEAN but also to India. Which is, in, uh, which is in link to the blue economy. Uh, when I talk about the various advantages that blue economy comes in, you also have to un understand there will be challenges and problems. So the significant environmental challenges from blue economy are what? Overfishing, marine pollution, and climate change. These, of course, are problems that they will all face, but you also have to understand this is our place. Why? Because India, Japan, and ASEAN can also find a way to synergize in these various, various areas. Okay, so now I'll talk about the third key synergy that is basically disaster management. You have to understand that the Indo-Pacific region is a highly vulnerable area. Why do you say that? Natural disasters are very predominant. We have earthquakes, we have tsunamis, we have cyclones. We have man-made disasters. Why do we have, we have nuclear incidents and industrial incidents? We spoke about all of those in the morning. So I'm not going to go, that, go there, but there's this proximity of time, so I'll keep skipping. We have to understand one thing very, very well, that India, Japan, and ASEAN have been able to identify disaster management in a very big way. According to a report by the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, India has been making significant process in disaster management, including the establishment of the National Disaster Management Authority and the implementation of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk, disaster risk Reduction. Also, ASEAN has been able to cater and work towards ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response. We already know that Japan is one of the leading uh, countries with regard to disaster management, and they have an extensive experience and expertise. I'll share a very personal example with you. So when I was in Japan um, in 2018 onwards, I've been to Japan twice, both on government scholarships. So in 2018, when I started staying in Japan for a longer period of time, so my first thing that my uh, student hostel uh, told me was how to manage uh, earthquakes and live in earthquakes. So they not only told me how to understand the map of an evacuation center, they told me the various codes of what uh, evacuation, uh, like as in what are the danger levels. They told me what a kit would have and what all I have to do in case of a disaster is hit. And similarly, I had gone on a holiday with my family to Sundarbans. Uh, I, because I'm a Bengali, I had the opportunity to speak to the locals in, uh, in Bangla. And uh, I realized that um, the, the kind of training that I was giving in Japan as to how I must deal in case of a you know, tsunami or an earthquake was something that people in Sundarbans were not given, but they were given very subtly. How were they given subtly? So, for example, whenever a cyclone comes in, they are firstly evacuated from the shore areas. Secondly, radio frequency starts. Local boys are accumulated and they are sent in groups to make the people aware that, you know what, please evacuate, move away, keep dry ration ready, because you got to be ready for something unseen. I realized one very simple thing. Of course, there is a way a developed country like Japan functions and how a, a different, like a developing country like India functions. But what made me really proud is I'm one person, I experienced both of them. And I realized one thing that this is what we can give back to ASEAN. 
we can give give back asia in a very specialized in a very nice form of disaster management kit which japan gives or teaches and we can give a very local fix that india teaches so this is something i realized that we could give uh, back to asean from japan and india okay again there are challenges with regard to disaster management firstly preparedness issues response and recovery and obviously uh, you have to understand that the critical timing is very important when a disaster hits if you do not at that particular time go and help people out then there isn't anything uh, okay Finally I talk about humanitarian assistance and aid and assistance which is very important as part of synergy between India Japan and ASEAN because uh, there is a need to have support uh, to communities when a natural disaster or a calamity is uh, hit uh, one of the major reasons is that uh, I I'll just quote a report International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society said that India has been leading contributor in disaster response efforts in the region Uh, specifically with regard to the sarc disaster management center asean also has something like this asean has a coordinating center for humanitarian assistance on disaster management japan in this in fact domain is very very efficient because it is not only financially helping people but it is also helping people materially you have to understand one very simple thing which i realized while i was doing the paper the last thing that i would say which is very important that we should focus on we never think of uh, humanitarian aid and assistance in the form of mental health and psychological development we always think of material money one thing i realized when i was reading one of the reports by uh, i think it was uh, the suga administration i do not remember exactly but i remember there was a picture of prime minister suga sitting with a little boy near the fukushima uh, i think it was the fukushima thing and i do not remember exactly i could be wrong but it was written that it is very important we focus on the psychological well-being of people so i would like to say one thing when india japan and asean together work in the domain of humanitarian aid and assistance one important thing that we should all work upon is psychological well-being of people right so this is how i conclude and thank you so much for your time Thank you Dr Roy for your very elaborate presentation I'm sorry time is a factor so we need to have uh, our three speakers and then more time for discussion there Dr Sanjana Jo uh, Good afternoon everyone uh, I hope you can hear me uh, so first of course uh, thank you very much uh, CPPR for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference it's uh, always happening to you know step out of our a sort of very uh, isolated in one sense world in new delhi and realize that you know there is uh, uh, so much more in the world and it's really a pity that uh, you know uh, a lot of these events don't happen outside of delhi and you know if, and my compliments to cppr for uh, starting uh, this initiative in uh, kochi and uh, in a sense institutionalizing it since this is the second conference uh, in their collaboration with the uh, uh, chennai council of Uh, Japan, so wonderful. And uh, before I go on to more sort of um, technical issues, I would also like to compliment CPPR uh, very much for uh, the um, number of uh, you know young women I have seen and interacted with who are part of this institution and who are very actively involved in the entire uh, organization and management. Uh, uh, of this uh, conference it's wonderful to see and it's also a, a reality check i think for me because for many years we at icre have kind of boasted about the fact that 60% of our uh, uh, faculty and and even the administrative staff are uh, women and we've taken great pride in that but i think it's wonderful to see it's happening uh, in other places and i must go back and tell ikrir we are not the only ones so wonderful uh, my compliments to you at uh, cppr thank you so much uh, my um, the two speakers uh, before me have already laid a wonderful uh, ground in terms of a very uh, useful discussion um, and um, uh, i i think i would like to just focus more on raising some questions 
which allow for greater debate and exchange of ideas uh, amongst all of us here as to how this whole Indo-Pacific construct is going to evolve in the future. So my presentation is titled India in the Indo-Pacific and I really wanted to look more at the economic uh, dimension uh, since uh, I was aware that my predecessors uh, would focus more on the strategic and uh, 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 aspects. Uh, of course, uh, Gitanjali made uh, wonderful suggestions about uh, non-traditional uh, you know, security concerns which are equally uh, important, but I really wanted to focus specifically on the economic uh, dimension. So my presentation is titled India in the Indo-Pacific, the economic uh, dimension. First and foremost, just as, uh, an overview of how India's uh, Indo-Pacific positioning has evolved. And I'd like to submit to this uh, audience that India's Indo-Pacific position has really gained uh, a lot of traction in just the last few years. Of course, the idea of the Indo-Pacific has been uh, debated and discussed uh, in academic and policy establishment circles for a long, long time. But in terms of very actionable uh, 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 initiatives, uh, India is today, uh, you know, very much involved with the whole uh, Indo-Pacific uh, vision and uh, and and. and as you can see, I, I, I will not go into all these initiatives, you are quite aware of them, you know, starting with the uh, Act East uh, policy, the enunciation of the Saga Doctrine, which is, which is essentially about growth and prosperity for everyone in the region, uh, going on to the uh, strengthening of uh, India-Japan uh, idea about the in Indo-Pacific, uh, the launch of the A Africa Asia Growth Corridor, uh, or what we've really sort of, uh, you know, come to a watershed uh, moment in the last uh, a year, a couple of years with uh, the uh, with uh, India joining the first Quad Leaders Summit, you know, very much an official part of the Quad, and also the uh, launch of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity in 2022 uh, by the United States and India uh, formally taking part in this. So uh, the first point that I uh, once again make is that India's Indo-Pacific positioning has gained a lot of traction in the last a uh, few years, just if you look at it, you know, just a span of about uh, six to seven years. Uh, the other point that I wanted to submit to you for your consideration is that it is India's growing economic heft which really underlines India's willingness to play a central role in the emergent or order. As a lot of people and experts have pointed out, uh, India is no longer a hesitant India. India is very willing and confident and assertive about what, it, uh, what its vision for the uh, Indo-Pacific is and how, one sh uh, and how this uh, vision should sort of move uh, forward. And this confidence is really, uh, uh, to, to a great extent, uh, um, underpinned and underlined by India's uh, growing economic strength. Just some figures to, uh, you know, illustrate this point. India is today one of the fastest uh, growing major economies and is currently ranked as the world's sixth largest economy. It's on track. Uh, um, well, we hope to become in the world's third largest economy by 2030. And uh, in the coming just one year, India is expected to provide almost 15% of global uh, growth uh, at a time when the global economy is facing significant uh, headwinds and is really on uh, a, a, in a not a very strong uh, footing. So this is where lies India's importance uh, to the global economy. Uh, what I try to do now is to unpack what are, economic, uh, what are India's economic interests and objectives in the Indo-Pacific that really uh, are guiding uh, the, uh, you know, how it uh, engages with the concept or the vision of the Indo-Pacific, uh, which has uh, uh, a number of, uh, or multitude of visions actually uh, today with everybody coming up with their own vision. So what is India's economic interest in this entire Indo-Pacific uh, construct? 
just some, uh, you know, uh, tables to show you that how India's trade uh, with the major Indo-Pacific economies has evolved uh, in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, so we have this figure of for 2010 and 2022 for each of the big, uh, what at least, uh, you know, are, um, are well recognized as the big economies of Indo-Pacific uh, uh, the, re the geographic region of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the, uh, the, this, this particular graph tries to tell you uh, the kind of impact that COVID-19 had on India's engagement, which had uh, started to become quite robust with all these Indo-Pacific uh, economies. And 2020, uh, you know, that's why it's highlighted in red, shows the sharp sort of uh, decline uh, that happened and what is, and and the subsequent rebound that has uh, occurred uh, the year on year change uh, graph in fact shows that you know the red part in 2022 there was uh, 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 india's uh, trade with all these uh, uh, major economies uh, declined very sharply and uh, but then you see the next one which is you know an absolutely amazing rebound in the just just the very uh, next year and then a more uh, steady uh, and uh, stable um, uh, engagement that is occurring in 2022 so the key points that uh, and and this graph uh, shows India's major exports to the Indo-Pacific economies. So in all these graphs that I showed you, what are the key points? So uh, the key points are that India's, uh, the, the point that uh, we as analysts need to take note is that India's total trade with the in major Indo-Pacific economies amounted to, you know, it was more than 400 billion in, 200, uh, in 2022. And this constitutes 39% of India's total trade with the world. And, you know, we hear a lot about our trade dependence on China, but the figures will sh uh, tell you that China's share in this entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, gamut of India's trade with uh, the world is only 12%. Uh, so it's not like it's an overwhelming uh, uh, you know, big uh, trade partner and we have a, a, a lot of fear, you know. So between 2020, uh, 2020, 2010 and 2022, India's trade with the major Indo-Pacific economies has more than doubled. And actually, uh, uh, if we go back to the chart, it would show that China's share used to be around 7 to 8% of this India's total trade with Indo-Pacific economies. Uh, uh, and it's only gone up to 12%. So there, there is something happening. There is a story here, which I will uh, come to in a little while. Uh, and uh, the third point I made was that there is a strong rebound from the sharp decline in trade uh, in 2022, uh, 20 due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this sharp rebound is uh, is essentially stemming from uh, 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 from the uh, not just the rebound but also increase in India's trade with the other Indo-Pacific economies, and most notably of those being Australia and the United States, you know. So it's, uh, it's something that we need to uh, understand and take into account when we are uh, looking at the strategic developments in the re uh, region because they, they point to why those strategic developments are taking place. There is an economic foundation to those uh, strategic initiatives. Uh, the exports uh, of uh, India to Indo-Pacific economies are, again, a, a big uh, part of our total exports and constitute 36% of our, uh, India's total exports. So uh, then when we come to uh, foreign direct investment, uh, again, the graphs uh, are quite sort of self-explanatory in terms of how much uh, uh, FDI inflows have uh, uh, changed uh, uh, into India from these Indo-Pacific uh, uh, economies and, you know, how much of an increase uh, uh, there is. 
th this chart is essentially showing uh, the cumulative uh, inflow uh, between tw uh, 2010 and 2021, and also the share of each of these uh, uh, big Asia-Pacific, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific economies on total FDI inflows into uh, India. Uh, the points, uh, the key points in these two graphs are that this cumulative uh, FDI that has come into India between 2020, 2010 and 2021, uh, sorry, the 22 uh, figures are not entirely updated, so we haven't taken them into account, but they don't really change the picture much. Uh, uh, they have come from Indo-Pacific economies, and th th this inflow constitutes 36% of all FDI inflows into India. The highest inflows uh, have been from ASEAN, and, uh, but uh, you know, not very far behind individually. The USA and Japan are the top investors in India with their share of 10% and 7% uh, respectively. So uh, to summarize the points uh, uh, that come out from the, this data on uh, trade and investment, uh, it shows a very, very strong uh, re economic relationship between uh, India and the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, economies. It also shows, I think, uh, uh, an interdependent relationship, that just as these economies are very important for uh, India in terms of its economic growth, the FDI figures uh, uh, essentially show that, you know, that how India is also uh, being considered a very important partner in uh, by these uh, economies. So this interdependent relationship between uh, uh, India and uh, the Indo-Pacific economies is really the core of uh, India's engagement uh, in the significant uh, economic initiatives that are ha happening in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, 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 the, the other point that I wanted to uh, make was that uh, about interdependence uh, was that uh, you know we've had uh, we had some discussion in the uh, in the morning about uh, you know attracting uh, Japanese uh, uh, SMEs and why uh, this hasn't happened and why the, they continue or to lag behind. So um, uh, my, um, I wanted to respond then, but I thought it's better if I do it now, uh, is that, you know, I think uh, it's uh, in terms of, uh, especially when we are looking at the entire gamut of the Indo-Pacific, while bilateral relationships are a very important part of this uh, construct and how, it's, uh, how this order is evolving, it is really the big picture which is going to determine how this order evolves uh, uh, in the future and how each of the uh, players is going to, uh, uh, and what advantages each of the players sees in, uh, in this uh, uh, construct. So uh, from India's point of view, as I said, uh, this is the Indo-Pacific is definitely a very important uh, aspect of its, uh, its own growth story. Uh, there have been, uh, I mean, there, have, uh, there were initial misconceptions uh, about, you know, uh, this whole idea of Atna uh, Nirbhar Bharat and the fact that India was perhaps turning protectionist and isolationist. But I think it's good to remember that the, the, the idea of uh, Atna Nirbhar Bharat was enunciated at, 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 when we were really sort of in the midst of the raging COVID pi uh, pandemic, where there was, uh, where everybody was unsure as to how, uh, uh, you know, we were going to cope with it. So there was a lot of emphasis on being self-reliant and being able to fend for ourselves. Uh, so in that sense, but uh, and the subsequent policies of the government and our uh, our, uh, our initiatives, uh, in fact, have uh, have very clearly shown that uh, uh, that a literal uh, translation of uh, Atm Nirbhar Bharat as an isolationist Bharat is, uh, is not perhaps right. The idea of Atm Nirbharta uh, is about self-reliance, but within, uh, uh, within an uh, open, uh, 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 within a global context, and uh, global engagement is very much part 
of uh, the Atmanirbhar uh, 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 con uh, uh, in the context. And uh, that's why uh, this whole emphasis on uh, in expanding India's exports, because if the idea was just to be isolationist and you know, be completely self-reliant, so uh, India's economic engagement with the Indo-Pacific cert uh, economies certainly is not isolationist, it's, uh, it's forward-looking, it's open-looking, uh, it is uh, based on, uh, you know, increasing trade and uh, investment uh, uh, linkages, and, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, increase in, in trade and investment linkages being beneficial both to India and to the world. So that was one point which I think very much uh, we need to understand, that India's Indo-Pacific uh, engagement is not uh, is very much uh, uh, an open uh, uh, open uh, vision. Now, but what the point is that uh, um, uh, the, the the crux of uh, this uh, um, session is what are the synergies between the IPOI, uh, which is enunciated by India, the FOIP, and the AOIP. Uh, and here, uh, I mean, I've taken a little liberty. I also, I'm also including the uh, FOIP, which has been enunciated by the United States, because I don't think we can ignore that in understanding how the Indo-Pacific uh, is uh, evolving. And when we look at the economic engagement or the economic dimensions of these uh, initiatives, uh, I have tried to sort of unpack four core issues that underpin uh, how these countries are engaging with each other and where they want to increase their engagement. So this is definitely trade, uh, connectivity, investment, and resilience. So resilience is now very, uh, it's perhaps a post-COVID uh, uh, response to the vulnerabilities in the global supply chain that was in, uh, induced by the pandemic. So this really forms the crux of the Indo-Pacific uh, economic uh, uh, framework. And, uh, the, and it's these four pillars which really uh, summarize the synergies between the various uh, vis visions uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, put forward. And uh, so, now how do, wh wh how do I see us going forward? I think, uh, I, as I mentioned, India's uh, um, participation in the IPEF, which is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, is a very watershed movement because we've been very hesitant about uh, uh, the RCEP and being part of uh, multilateral uh, economic frameworks as, they as we felt that they didn't really suit us. Uh, but I think uh, the fact that India has, show, uh, has uh, uh, accepted uh, to be part of this uh, uh, underlines two, uh, uh, a, a, few, uh, a few significant points. One, that in, it is uh, the fact that this, uh, uh, as, we, uh, as you might be aware, India has uh, opted out of the trade framework of the IP, uh, the pillar of the IPEF. And uh, the others have been quite uh, understanding, and, 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 and so, in a sense, the idea of flexibility is built into the IPF, which I think assuages India's concerns to a large extent as to how, wh when they can join and in what form uh, they would like to bind themselves to a multilateral uh, economic uh, order that, take, that, takes, uh, um, that, that gets built in the region. Uh, and in this, uh, uh, the, 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 what the future holds really is that building consensus on the fine prints, because India does have very uh, important concerns relating to labor, environment, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, dig even uh, the digital economy, as to how these are going to affect India's core uh, economic interests. So building consensus on the fine print will be really the key. And it is in this context that the India-Japan uh, relationship and India-Japan cooperation can play a very important role uh, in ensuring that India remains engaged with the Indo-Pacific economic uh, uh, order that is uh, evolving. And 
of, of, and for that, I think I, I'll just end by giving the example of the RCEP, where the Japanese really went out of their way to ensure that India somehow, uh, you know, joined the RCEP. They kept the, the, the negotiations were very, very, uh, um, very, very uh, strong uh, in India's favor by the Japanese. And so it is something like that which, which uh, Japan perhaps will once again have a role to play in ensuring that India does not come back from this huge big step it's taken. So they would be looking to their Japanese uh, friends to uh, take care of their interests. The other important uh, uh, element which is more topical, I think, especially as the Japanese Prime Minister is coming uh, to India, uh, in a couple of days uh, time i think I india and uh, india would also is also looking to uh, japan to uh, to really harmonize the uh, the uh, the agendas and the interests uh, 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 between the g7 and the g20 and ensure that both uh, the countries who are the respective uh, presidents of the two forums, Japan being for the G7 and India for the G20, that these two forums will play a constructive role in, you know, um, in dealing with global governance issues. And that's how I'd like to end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjana, for the eloquent presentation, which has been a quantitative analysis that of the flow of investments and the robustness of the India-Japan, as well as the ASEAN trade factors there. Now, we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, please identify yourself, and please be brief on your question. Uh, that's there. Professor Pradhan. Thank you, Professor Lawrence. I think it was a wonderful uh, you know, panel. Hardcore security geopolitics to geoeconomics, and non-traditional security. I, I think it makes a complete package. My quick question, uh, you know, Professor Nalpod also uh, you know, spoke about the Pacific char Charter, or you also talked about that. My, I mean, uh, uh, 20 years ago, I was writing uh, something on this line, where we thought of European Parliament is there. They have a place where the conflicting countries of Europe, they came together to talk about the conflicts, cooperations, possibilities, we, uh, in the entire uh, Asian continent or the Indo-Pacific, we do not have a single platform where you can simply meet for a cup of tea and talk. So we have conflicts and we have regionalism, we have West Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, you have many, many then Pacific Islands and all that. So is there any, any case for a, for a you know, institution where Asia or Indo-Pacific region can simply come and meet and talk to each other you know, for some time, so maybe something might emerge. That's one question. And Professor uh, Sanjana, uh, wonderful presentation. And a uh, trade deficit also, I'm just pure inquiry, a trade deficit also has uh, substantially increased than earlier times. And you're talking about the trade quantity also has in equally increased. And now, uh, are we, are we uh, increasing our exports? Uh, or we are importing more and then uh, sharing prosperity with others. Thank you. I am Father Churchill, General Secretary for South Asian Fishermen Fraternity, coming from Kanyakumari in Tamil Nadu. Both Kidanchali as well as Sanjana spoke about the possibilities of making use of Indian Pacific Ocean for economical development. And uh, Kidanjali spoke very clearly about the issues in maritime security. Seeing all these possibilities, we are thinking of maximum use of the Pacific Ocean. So far, the traditional fishermen have been using the ocean. Now, the corporate and developed countries facing towards that ocean. When it goes to the hand of corporate, absolutely there will be Pollution. Pollution in the sense it will be misused, overused. Without having any policy for those activities, if you are going to open the ocean,
ఫర్ డెవలప్ పర్పస్ వార్ విట్ విల్ ఎండ్ అప్ వన్ క్వశ్చన్ సెకండ్ వెన్ ద కార్పొరేట్ డెవలప్డ్ కంట్రీస్ కమ్ ఇన్ వాట్ అబౌట్ ద ట్రెడిషనల్ ఫిషర్మెన్ దోస్ హాబిన్ ఎర్నింగ్ దర్ లైవ్లీహుడ్ ఫ్రమ్ దేర్ దే మస్ట్ బీ రీప్లేస్డ్ థర్డ్ without considering the traditional fishermen those who are using generation to generation the ocean if we go for the development by the corporate developed will it be a true development of the nation thank you good afternoon everyone my name is josh i'm a private citizen and an entrepreneur um I'd like to thank CPPR and the panelists for a wonderfully informative uh, dialogue. Uh, my question primarily is I'm picking on a couple of key words that have been running through all the presentations. The first thing is with uh, regard to Professor Lawrence's uh, discourse was about the strategic requirement for Indo- Indo-Pacific cooperation. And the second aspect is the 800-pound gorilla that is in this room, which is not really being mentioned, which is China. And as they say, emerging aggressive politi- uh, policies. Chinese policies today are aggressive because they have been on a strategic implementation of this idea over the last 50 years. So rather than responding Uh, in a reactive way, is there a proactive way within which Indo-Japanese uh, and ASEAN, or including Quad, the different uh, countries together, can respond over a longer period of time to counter the only country in this region which has territorial, and especially maritime territorial aspirations. If you look at the economy of China, and you compare it, it exceeds the combined economies of all the uh, countries in the Indo-Japanese, uh, ASEAN, including if you throw in Australia. So it's a very big job, and how would you approach that strategically is basically my question. Okay. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair, for this opportunity to put up a comment and uh, some questions. First, let me compliment you for recalling uh, Professor Nalpat's whole idea about Indo-Pacific Charter. And I'm glad you listed out the five pillars. They were, I think they're robust. I think uh, a little more deliberation and discussion would offer us opportunity to add a few more to make it more comprehensive. I think that's a useful approach. Maybe CPPR can take a cue out of it. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Tamari and also to Dr. Sanjana Joshi. Uh, Dr. Joshi, you make a reference to AAGC. What is the present status from, the New, from New Delhi's point of view and what is the status from Tokyo's point of view? Dr. Tamari, if you would like to elaborate on that. Uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Roy, well, um, you listed out a large number of non-traditional security. Very useful. I think that has been on the agenda for a long, long time and we keep adding to the menu time and again as we meet, every time we meet, we have a new agenda to talk about. But when you look about you know, the whole situation now, when we talk about within the uh, Indo-Pacific, I think we are gone past the stage of looking at the whole region from a constructivist point of view. We are into a realist paradigm. There are hard geopolitics, hard security issues which are there. Now it is there that we'll have to, and keeping in why I'm raising this issue is there is not enough capacity either with Japan or with India that we converge and meet up in South China Sea. It's tyranny of geography for us. We always tend to forget while we talk about all these cooperations, Ford, etc. There is tyranny of geography. We cannot meet up. And when we meet up, we meet up a ship and a half on either side. So probably we'll have to look at it a little more. I mean, it's a good idea to build those. I'm not dismissing non-traditional security. They're going to be with us for a long, long time. But I think the focus will have to be start looking at desegregating the quad. Now, quad minus two would be Japan and India. And there you work out new issues where we can work together. Maybe like the, with, with the United States, we do more exercises than any other country does with, uh, with them. So maybe a, a trend line could be built up on selectively looking at issues where we can. Also, I would like also to draw your attention, you mentioned about seabed uh, resources. 
Now, again, South China Sea, seabed is under the International Seabed Authority. So none of us can literally go and start digging on the seabed. We have to, we have an opportunity to work together. We go to Clipperton Clarion in the Pacific. That is where we can build it up. And mining core, if we must have, we must also now develop a discourse between India and Japan convergences on what this mining code will be all about, which is going to come up for you. Is there a convergence? Are we talking on the same lines? And I think there such things can build up and also we could borrow a similar kind of a, you know, a kind of a trajectory of that sort and bring it to the Indian Ocean where we ourselves are going to be prospecting. I'll stop at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me just quickly answer and then I'll pass on the mic to others. To Professor Pradhan and to our friend uh, about the lack of institutionalization in, in Asia there. I think one of the major deterrents why Asia has not been institutionalized or the level of institutionalization has not come is the absence of a major war actually there. I think war has been a catalyst of institutionalization. This is a controversial hypothesis. But if you look in the European context, much of the institutionalization took place both in the context of the two world wars, which has been Euro-based, Euro and also the fact that the, uh, that the nations of Europe were direct victims of that actually there. Now Asia went through various uh, post-Cold War, uh, Cold War conflicts, post-World War, Cold War conflicts, but the level by which these countries could come together has lacked into that there. That's one reason why you don't have a mutual security defense organization like NATO in this region. And you find that it is all bilaterals, multilaterals and minilaterals, both in economic context and as well as in the military context, that this conflict has been there. It will take a long time before Asia comes a full circle by which they would go into this institutionalization there. Now, uh, I mean, we deliberately avoid China because if you look into both the aspects of the Quad as well as this, uh, they do concentrate on the positive aspects of cooperation without mentioning the adversarial threat there. The reason is that uh, Quad, neither Quad nor the Indo-Pacific countries, powers, are bound by a collective defense organization there. Only in a collective defense organization, you will find the identification of the enemy actually there. That's been significantly absent in the, in the case of this, and therefore China has always been postured as an adventurous power an aggressive, aggressive power and, and without naming into that. The reason again is basically because you find that like India, Japan, United States, Australia do have a strong dependency of trade with China there and that needs, should not be jeopardized. That has been one factor that has been there. I'll leave for the other participants to please answer the questions. It should work. But uh, uh, that level of consensus has not come at the Quad is a platform, but the Quad itself is not qualified yet to go into it because the Quad needs to be an alliance-based partnership, not an interest-based partnership actually. There. Only in an alliance-based partnership, you will find that the United States taking the role. Of course, the US, Japan, US, Australia, hub and spokes arrangement is there, but India doesn't come into the picture there. So therefore, when you don't have a treaty-based uh, structure, to create a maritime security equivalent of the NATO will be extremely difficult, actually. Oh, 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 okay. So, uh, so your, question, your question is about uh, Tokyo's view on IPEF, right? Uh, oh, sorry, Asia, Africa. Actually, sorry, uh, I'm on basically on security side, so security and development issues, so I have no, no idea about it, sorry. So uh, there was a question on maritime security and how uh, there's a misuse and misuse of how fisheries and all that could happen. Father, you had that question. Uh, to be honest, Father, I'm not a specialist in this, but I try, I'll try to answer your question. Obviously, in my presentation, I mentioned about environmental issues. I, I cannot go further than that, but I can give you one issue that the ASEAN countries have. Uh, I think it was two years ago. I had attended an online um, conference with uh, countries, all the countries of ASEAN, and young leaders and uh, you know policy formulators. So, with regard to fishing, there was one issue which kept on coming. All the leaders and diplomats and the uh, young policy, uh, the, the policy formulators kept saying that we are worried about food security and water security. They are really worried about what will happen to the future with regard to food security. That is a major concern and they do not know what to do. Because they went on for two days on that. 
and there was no definitive answer on how we could deal with the issue of food security for the future. Um, there was another question with regard to traditional fishermen and the corporate taking over. To be really honest, uh, right now also we are working on uh, the, the ways the old style fishing practices have continued, but the new innovative practices do not damage or harm the old style. That is the present scenario. Future, I do not know, to be very honest. And uh, yes, that's about it. Thank you. Sorry to intervene. In many platforms, these things are discussed but never answered to the core question. In the land, you have lot of instruments to check whether it is violated or not. But in the ocean, even proper, your jurisdiction security is not done properly, it is not possible in the vast sea. When you open the sea for anybody, because if it is between Australia and India, or Oman or India, Sri Lanka or India, or Indonesia or India, okay, it is true country. But international water, you are opening to any landlocked as well as coastal states. Any state can come for any purpose especially for undermining also. They can. Okay, if you open the sea for everybody, who can control anyone? Nobody can control anyone. That's why see how we dare to open the sea to everybody when you are not able to protect your own sea by yourselves. I'm sorry. That's truly really taken, yeah. First and foremost, uh, the, uh, the, the question you, you raised about trade deficits and how our trade deficit with these countries. Uh, um, if I'm not... Uh, the mic, please. Hold it. Sir, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so if I'm not being very simplistic, but, uh, you know, I think one thing is very clear. One thing is very clear now that uh, you know the whole uh, global economy is quite interconnected, and we're really talking of global supply chains and how uh, countries need to be part of these chains. So, in that sense, uh, uh, a country's deficit really is not uh, the important part. It's the strength of its economy because a lot of our deficit are really comprises of components trade. You know, our dependence on the world is really for parts and components and materials uh, that go into uh, the uh, production of a finished product, and then they are exported out of uh, 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 of the country. So, to 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 make a simple correlation between a deficit and a strength of an economy, I think that is no longer uh, correct, and it's quite sort of well understood uh, now. Uh, then. Uh, Talking about the AEGC, uh, um, the issue raised by um, uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Sakuja, uh, I, um, I would concur with uh, Professor Tamari that there is not much information about where this AEGC lies at the moment, despite the fact that it was uh, announced with a great deal of fanfare by uh, India and Japan, and then they sort of backtracked on it a bit when I think they, 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 they sort of ran into a lot of um, uh, opposition uh, 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 from the Chinese uh, uh, side. But uh, the, uh, the most tangible example of the uh, AEGC, uh, in my opinion, from our bilateral point of view, is the India-Japan cooperation for infrastructure development that's happening in the Northeast, because that was and is supposed to be part of the AEGC uh, idea of uh, quality infrastructure development across the region. So in that sense, bilaterally, uh, the, the initiative has uh, been uh, very important, and it uh, 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 just uh, a visit to the Northeast will tell you the kind of uh, emphasis on infrastructure development that the present government has put on that, and the Japanese are playing a very strong uh, role uh, in this entire 
process, in fact, uh, uh, on a slightly sort of lighter note, there are many places in the Northeast where I've gone where people have said, oh, you know, please tell Jaika they should do this. So Jaika is in the sense the new god that people are looking at, you know, whether to fix a road to a village or to fix a, uh, fix a, a particular bridge and say, oh, I wish Jaika would take in, look at this and build it. So in that sense, the AEGC is uh, uh, quite uh, important from India and Japan's perspective. I'm not very sure, uh, this is all based on uh, media reports, but I just report, I read a report last night that one of the things that uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, of Japan uh, is going to discuss with Prime Minister Modi is, his, is, the, Japan, is the Japanese plan to sort of help, uh, you know, uh, uh, revive this idea of the AEGC cor uh, corridor and how uh, they can help in infrastructure uh, development and capacity building. I hope that's true. I mean, it's just uh, something I read in it. So I believe it will come back again uh, and when the time is right, because the idea was right, and the idea has potential in it. So that, uh, then, um, is that it, I think? Uh, is not when, when we're talking about I mean somebody this is an, just a response not an answer but somebody here said why are we not talking about China you know so I think uh, from from my point of view I, I'd like to say that you know from an economic point of view China is definitely a very important factor in the the way the indo-pacific economic order is evolving but uh, but because we're living in an interdependent world, so I, I think that initial rhetoric of decoupling from China and you know the and the how the so entire supply chain of the world sort of uh, came to a standstill with COVID has go gone. But definitely the importance of India uh, in the evolving Indo-Pacific economic order is in terms of a. Uh, of diversification, you know, or it's it's now the strategy really is China plus one, and India is very much part of that, and it's it's uh, encouraging that because it also is not really interested in uh, a large scale sort of pulling out of uh, uh, firms out of China and bringing them into India. So India is very happy and very much a part of the China plus one diversification strategy. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman, Dr. John, and then Dr. Vijay Shakuja. I think one more question, and then we will finally wind up the session. And yes, three, four questions. That's all. Quickly, Dr. Tamari, um, um, and thank you for elaborating the conceptual aspects of Indo-Pacific from a Japanese perspective. Um, I mean, so while India and Japan talks about Indo-Pacific, I mean, there is the larger uh, Indian outlook or, or a geopolitical construct which is, well, there is this often talk about multipolarity as India's vision of regional or uh, global order or well, in a sense that Asian multipolarity as a framework of India looking at the world, global multipolarity because, well, I, I do think that the Japanese have a different way of looking at those issues. So in a sense that how does this aspect of India's, uh, I mean, geopolitical vision uh, fits into the Japanese uh, um, uh, framework of looking at India-Japan relations. Um, uh, the second question that I would like to ask is, uh, again, a, a Professor uh, Lawrence Prefav would uh, uh, answer, is as you mentioned about, uh, I mean, in, in your description of Indo-Pacific chapter, um, you mentioned about a value as one of the key pillars, particularly democracy, and India has been very reticent about this aspect. Uh, how do you think that uh, uh, it's going to play an important pillar if, if, if uh, an Indo-Pacific charter or, or a larger framework to come, out, uh, come about. Because I, I do see there is this larger hesitation on the part of India to, to take up the value as, uh, as, as an important aspect of its foreign policy framing. Thank you. Uh, mine is not a question or a comment, just to put uh, a lot of comfort to Father Churchill. Last week, uh, intergovernment organization, intergovernment agreement has been signed. Let me read out. It's a long one. Intergovernmental conference on an internationally legally binding instrument under the United Nations Convention on the Law of Sea, that is UNCLOS, on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. That means it's, it's short form BBNJ. That means all sea areas are now under the watch card. It's not open. 
So there will be a lot of comfort for you on this. Okay, next yes. question, please. Hello. Yes. Um, ma'am, yes, my doctor. question is to Sanjana, ma'am. So uh, uh, you have been talking about this trade relationship with Indo-Pacific. So uh, India-Japan trade hasn't much picked up. It's been like 20 billion around. Like, uh, so have you done any comparison with ASEAN, India-ASEAN trade relationship, which has been picking up very fast? So have you done a comparison where and why India trade with Japan is falling short? Uh, this is my first question. And second question is that uh, to the father, like uh, Churchill, where he mentioned about uh, the same issues, like uh, International Seabed Authority, Secretary General here in India for 14 days trip actually, last month. Uh, so uh, we actually, we have raised this particular issue. Uh, and they also coming out with a kind of uh, seminar. If you're interested, you can uh, send the abstract and you can participate in the conference and you, you can raise this issue. As uh, Vijay Shakulja has pointed out, sir, I, I think that is actually in the discussion, but still it's not yet uh, materialized as such. That's what the discussion panel they mentioned. It's going to be a high seas treaty, which is going to be in force, which allows the corporate sector to do a kind of exploration based on sustainable development. But again, uh, how much is the environment damage? Who is going to assess it is still a main issue. Uh, so who is going to, even International Seabed Authority only governs seabed mining. It doesn't control all the volumes of water. So that's been an issue. So I thought like that. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, thank you very much. And a uh, small comment and uh, question to mainly to Sanjana. And uh, I see uh, the question from uh, uh, Fisherman Associate him. And uh, Sanjana has a little bit related. I mean that uh, uh, autonomy versus openness. So we talked about uh, rule-based order, openness of uh, uh, FOIP, but uh, still there are some uh, um, antagonism between openness versus uh, sovereignty or security, and also um, openness, uh, in interdependence versus uh, Atma Nirmal Bharat. So uh, I, I want to know what does uh, India thinking about uh, this uh, uh, balance because uh, from the Japanese point of view, we uh, the, 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 the supply chain, supply chain, and uh, uh, China plus one is uh, each each uh, not not only the governmental issue. It's uh, each um, business uh, supply chain, each company supply chain, and it it was mostly created in China and ASEAN for these 20 years. So it's difficult for them to suddenly shift to India. So if India is not uh, uh, connected to um, ASEAN central um, economic framework and China centric economic framework, those businessmen does not want to go to uh, India. So, but uh, you know, the security, from the economic security point, now Japanese, uh, Japan has uh, um, awakened to, to, to the not too much uh, dependence on China, but still there are some debate on uh, autonomy versus uh, security. So wh what is uh, India's debate and what is their thinking on this? Uh, just a very brief answer, uh, Mario and I can discuss uh, later. It's tied up uh, to what the, uh, that person said about, you know, why India, uh, Japan trade is sort of uh, uh, stagnating. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, 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 Ideologically or in terms of principles, yes, there, there are uh, seeming contradictions between the idea of uh, autonomy or self-reliance and interdependence uh, with the world. I think uh, from India's point of view, uh, it would be, uh, the short answer would be, as I said, it's not about uh, uh, isolation or it's uh, not about interdependence also in the world. It's about engagement with the world. And, and India wants to be, I think, in a sense, be able to control its engagement uh, with the world, uh, at least in the economic sphere, because it, we are a big country, we are a diverse country, we have, uh, you know, major issues. Or we, we, uh, we are not uh, the uh, Asian tigers. We have a diverse uh, population, diverse needs. So we have a lot of factors which we need to uh, balance. And uh, the point about, uh, you know, companies just cannot start, uh, uh, pick up and uh, leave in uh, China. So as I said, that's, that's really what not is, hap is not happening. It's all about China plus one or diversification. 
And uh, it is, I think, uh, in that sense, the global multinational companies have been much, much uh, faster in recognizing the importance and the need for this. And the prime example of that is Apple. You know, I mean, it's not easy for Apple. It's not as if Apple is shutting shop in uh, China. But in the last two years, and now uh, just yesterday, I think they've announced there is another uh, new uh, production center that they are going to open in India. So they do. So it's all about you know looking to the future in a positive manner. It's not about uh, somebody's loss or somebody's gain. It's about making sure that these uh, that these interconnections don't get disrupted in any. Any manner and pandemic I think in that sense has accelerated the process so now the need for diversification is really being understood in an economic manner and not just a strategic manner earlier it was easy to dismiss it so only if there is a blockade of the uh, sea can the supply chain uh, get uh, disrupted but then now the world has realized there are many other ways that we never really thought of uh, but we've experienced so this is contingency planning so in that sense, that's uh, that's what in in terms of India Japan trade, uh, it again I think it's a, it's a slightly misleading picture as you said, if if there is a direct comparison with uh, ASEAN, uh, uh, I don't have the figures on me right now, but it's all easily available in the public domain. A big part of ASEAN's trade with India is actually Japan's trade with India because it's those components which are being manufactured in the ASEAN countries, especially for the automobile sector, etc. So a lot of it is that also. So it's not just black and white that trade with ASEAN has increased and trade with Japan has not increased. Yes, there is an issue about the Japanese SMEs not wanting to sort of locate themselves in India. And uh, the funny part is that I think we've all banged our heads uh, uh, to, uh, to an answer to this question, but nothing seems to work. So Jetro now is actually trying to say that, you know, uh, is trying to convince Indian companies, you go and buy Japanese SMEs, and then you bring them to India. So that's the, maybe that is a more realistic and, a, and more encouraging way forward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tamari. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, thank you for a good question, John. And uh, yeah, geopolit geopolitically, uh, Japan and India share common challenges from China. So we came closer. But uh, regarding geo global politics, we were uh, different. India seeks democratization of world politics, and Japan does not. So we were different. But it seems to me that India is changing its position. Now, for, uh, for India, it is difficult to cooperate with China in, on every issue. We, and also, um, cooperation with Russia it will be difficult also. And now India, uh, India uh, is using Global South discourse again. And if so, in, if so uh, it seems to me, it seems to me that uh, we will have more chance to cooperate even in the global politics stage. Thank you, yeah. Thank you uh, panelists, for your uh, excellent presentations. And let me finally just put in three points, uh, which is essentially the summary of these presentations. That the synergies of the three ocean, uh, Indo-Pacific Ocean outlooks are basically congruent to each other. And I think they have multiple elements of security, of uh, economics, of digital, and of also of value constraints, which basically form part of it there. Secondly, we find that uh, much of that is not a, an easy direct-to-direct -direct, uh, solution, but they're rather convoluted actually there because of the fact that the world has increasingly become economically interdependent. And this complex interdependence is one that is driving the Indo-Pacific region in a more uh, rapid way there. And thirdly, I think China is going to be sooner or later going to be the, the, sinus, uh, the, the focus of attention because that sinocensure of attention is going to come, even though there is a reluctance on the part of countries to name it into that there. Even as China's aggressive actions increase, that is going to basically come into it. And finally, let me uh, admire and appreciate uh, Father Churchill for all the work that he's done. And I think uh, good results will come out of your efforts. Thank you and God bless. Professor Lawrence, for your moderation. I would also like to thank all the
speakers for their insightful presentation. I now invite Mr. Gopinath Panangat to give away, give away a token of appreciation to the chair and the panelists of the session. I request Professor Lawrence and the panelists, Dr. Kasutoshi Tamarisa, Ms. Sanjana Joshi, and Professor Geetanjali Sinha Roy to come forward and receive the token of appreciation.